Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, that last question was a nice segue into this talk. So, androlateral tenodesis. Let's see if we do have the final word or not. Uh, just some disclosures. Uh, the main regarding this particular work is we have some research uh, sponsored by Smith and Nephew, as well as research funding from the Canadian Institute of Health Research, as well as the National Institute of Health. So if we start with a case, and these are cases that we're all going to see in our, in our office. Um, so this is a 17-year-old football player. Uh, she's, uh, she has a non-contact plant and pivot injury. She's a classic ACL injury. Wants to return to competitive football. And we see her in the clinic, and it's a number of weeks out from injury. Her knee's nice and, nice and quiet. There's no effusion. She's got a good range of motion. Uh, she's a fairly significant anterior laxity on Lachman. No significant uh, collateral laxity, um, but what you're going to see in a second is a fairly large pivot shift. Uh, I do check for ro rotatory laxity here, so external rotation laxity, so essentially a dial, dial test, which is checking for both anteromedial rotatory laxity as well as posterolateral, and then a large pivot shift. So her radiographs uh, are fairly unremarkable, apart from a slightly elevated uh, posterior tibial slope, but her MRI scan really shows a little bit more than an ACL going on. She's got a classic bone bruise pattern. Uh, she's got a soft tissue injury in the lateral side. She's got a lateral meniscus posterior root tear. So if we do sort of a, an analysis of risk factors for this young girl, she's young, she's got high-grade knee laxity, uh, she's got a meniscus injury, she's got abnormal bony morphology with associated patholaxity. So the question comes, should we add an LET? Well, before we get into that, I think it's important that we take a bit of a step back in history and start talking a little bit about the anterolateral complex, because, of course, the anterolateral ligament is nothing new. It was uh, first described back in the 50s, uh, where uh, this is some of the seminal work by uh, Kaplan uh, describing the IT band. And, of course, Werner Mueller, as well as uh, Glenn Terry, have all described this anterolateral structure as being uh, on the lateral side of the knee controlling uh, anterolateral rotatory laxity. And depending really what you read, depends on whether or not you think this is a capsular structure or indeed a part of the IT band. And certainly this study by Vieira really nicely thought about the ACL and the uh, capsulosseous layer uh, of the deep part of the IT band as creating this horseshoe effect, like a sling effect around the lateral femoral condyle to control anterolateral ro rotatory laxity. But then came 2011, or, uh, 2011 with this study from uh, Stephen Klass that uh, raised a little bit of controversy and uh, you know even Mr. Williams chimed in with uh, a little editorial commentary so it was quite an interesting time. But it did spark a number of anatomical studies. Uh, we got involved with in that initially and uh, you know we have shown that there is a structure in the anterolateral capsule uh, and if we really focus in on the anatomy you can see here this is the IT band, this is the right knee and you can see when you reflect from anterior to posterior you get the uh, the proximal and distal Kaplan fibers, and then more distally, you have this structure notified by the asterisks that really show this, this deep capsulosseous layer of the IT band. So this is not part of the capsule, this is part of the IT band, and this is what Lobenhalfer also described as these retrograde condylar fibers. Um, and so it's really the IT, then the ALL is really sitting within the anterolateral capsule. The biomechanics have been very well uh, investigated and they've shown a number of things, but this is, I think this is really quite a nice uh, graph which tells the story in that you have the superficial IT tract controlling internal rotation in deeper degrees of flexion, the deep capsulosseous layer having quite a significant role, again, through the range of motion, with the anterolateral ligament having an impact, but really only a minimal impact, with the ACL's impact really decreasing as you go from extension down into flexion. Um, I was uh, lucky enough, I don't know if it was lucky really, but uh, con on chairing this anterolateral complex consensus meeting, as I'm sure you can imagine trying to get consensus on this topic was not exactly easy. But we did uh, describe the anatomy and summarized uh, the biomechanics in this particular paper. So if we understand that the anterolateral capsule has a role in controlling anterolateral uh, rotatory laxity, then it really comes down to what happens clinically. Should we be using a reconstruction and we did this systematic review as my master student Chris Hewison and he showed that by uh, looking at comparative studies that anterolateral uh, procedures reduce the pivot shift and that's been shown in a number of other studies with very similar results but it really comes down to what are our indications and from the consensus meeting we really needed some better data to guide us and uh, 
thankfully, we had started the, the stability study randomized clinical trial back in 2014. So this is a nine-center study across Canada and Europe, sponsored by Isikos. And we randomized uh, 618 patients who were all under the age of 25 years old. Uh, they, were, uh, they had to have uh, ACL deficient knee, obviously. They were slightly mature, up to 25 years of age, and then had a number of criteria that, that made them at higher risk of re-injury. The intervention was a soft tissue a hamstring autograft. We, we really tried our best to try and increase our graft diameter so it was greater than eight millimeters. And then the, the intervention under study was a modified Lemaire LET. And this has been described in a number of publications using a one centimeter wide, eight centimeter long strip of the posterior half of the IT band, tunneled under the fibular collateral ligament and reattached to the distal femur with a simple staple. Uh, we screened over 1,000 patients, randomized over 600 patients. We had uh, relatively equal numbers in both groups, and we had less than 5% uh, loss to follow up at the two-year uh, final endpoint. Uh, we had a 19 years of age of a mean uh, between both groups. There was no difference within our demographics. And just to summarize the results of stability, one, we find a significant reduction in rotatory laxity. We showed a significant reduction in graft failure. So this is a 66% reduction in graft failure when an LET was added to a hamstring tendon autograft. No difference in patient reported outcomes, no difference in overall uh, uh, complications, no clinical difference in strength of functional testing at 12 and 24 months, and no real difference in return to sport rates. Now, you, many of you are thinking, well, what about ALL reconstruction? Surely it's not all about the LET. Well, sure. Uh, the ALL reconstructions have actually done pretty well as, uh, as well, again showing 50% reduction in, in ACL re reconstruction failure by the Santi group, albeit these are most case series as opposed to randomized clinical trials, so there may be some selection bias here. But when we actually look at systematic review of recent comparative studies, we're all seeing the same thing, 50% reduction in graft failure, and it's important to note most of these studies are focused on a hamstring tendon autograft, so soft tissue autograft with the addition of an anterolateral procedure, 50% 50 50 reduction in failure. Now, we did look at the predictors of outcome, because again, it comes down to that question, what are our indications for surgery? So we uh, did a, a, a multivariable logistic regression model, and this paper recently was awarded the Houston Award uh, from, from AJSM. And we found that basically the LET uh, reduces uh, ACL uh, reconstruction odds of graft rupture by 60%. Age is an important factor. So each one year increase in age reduces the odds of rotational laxity. Return to sport, we touched on it earlier on with, uh, with Dinshaw. If you delay return to sport, we reduce the, the odds of graft rupture. Preoperative high-grade knee laxity. So if patients have high-grade anterior laxity or rotatory laxity with a pivot shift, over three times higher odds of graft rupture. And then posterior tibial slope, no shock there. That's been studied in multiple studies that each one degree of increase of posterior tibial slope increases their odds of graft rupture by 15%. So if you go back to that young girl at the start, 17 year old, yes, she's got young age, high grade laxity, meniscus injury, bony morphology, associated patholaxity, should we add an LET? Well, we already asked you the question, what's your graft of choice? And this really nice study from uh, Maria Tuka, this Isikos study, and this is all members of Isikos. Well, the majority of us are actually using hamstring tendons. And most of you in the room, 80 to 90% of you put your hand up saying you're hamstring tendons. So the answer is probably clearly you should be using an LET in this scenario. And I, I live and work in, in North America. And if you look at in, uh, the North American data, well, BTB is a very much more common graft than in many other parts of the world. And so I have a lot of my colleagues say to me, why on earth would I want to do an LET if I use a BTB? So we did try and study this. We took, a, this is a study from the Moon cohort. So Moon published their, their six and 10 year outcomes in young patients. So these were collegiate athletes going back to contact pivoting sports and they compared the hamstring tendon versus patella tendon grafts. And they found that the hamstring tendon grafts had a, a, a higher failure rate. So we took that same data set and we used their risk calculator and we plugged in our data from stability as a way of uh, really trying to validate their risk calculator, but also doing an indirect comparison to uh, BTB with hamstring tendon plus LET. And what we see is that the BTB and the hamstring tendon plus LET appear to be protective. In other words, they're doing relatively similarly, but the indirect comparison may also suggest that the LET could provide additional protection. So patella tendon is good. Could we make it better with the, with the addition of an LET? 
maybe. But of course, it's an indirect comparison. It's not really solid science to really make those uh, conclusions. What it does really support is the idea of avoiding isolated hamstring tendon grafts for young active patients or those with high-grade knee laxity. So actually, the biggest risk factors in many of these cases are the fact we're using a hamstring graft in a young patient going back to sport. And we can think about all these other risk factors that are associated, but it's the age and the soft tissue graft that is really driving our failure rates. Now, could patella tendons be even better? Well, Andy put, um, presented this work at the ACL study group, um, and uh, you know his, his data set would suggest that his lowest re-rupture rate was 2%, I think I was right in thinking, with BTB plus LET. So maybe that is, maybe that is the gold standard as we've just seen. But we don't really know, and that's why we started Stability 2. And so Stability 2 is a randomized controlled trial comparing patella tendon uh, and quadricep tendon, because of course quad tendon is the new kid on the block and everybody thinks it's very sexy, and that's gonna change everything that we do. But we don't really know, there's no good comparative data. And all these patients, again, under the age of 25, randomized to BTB versus quad with or without uh, a lateral tenodesis. We've already randomized 515 patients but we'll be targeting 1,200 patients, which we hope uh, we'll be able to complete in the next uh, two years. So what are my current indications for LET? Well, certainly I add it in the majority of my revisions. And then in the primary scenario, pretty much all young active patients that want a hamstring tendon graft, if they're, having, if they're young going back to sport and they want a hamstring for some reason, they get a lateral tenodesis. And then we're starting to look at, at, if not going for either a patella tendon or a quadricep tendon, then looking for these extra risk factors, uh, such as generalized ligamentous laxity, hyperextension, recurvatum, pivoting sports, tibial slope. And I think slope is a massive predictor of a risk of re-injury. And then of course the chronic lateral notch, which also has a role to play in high grade rotatory laxity. So in summary, LET does reduce rotational laxity. It does reduce graft failures. There are multiple studies now showing at least 50% reduction in graft failure with an addition of a lateral procedure. Importantly, this is when we do it with a hamstring tendon autograft. Remember, the majority of surgeons are still using a hamstring tendon autograft. It's still a great graft. 90% of patients will still do well. It's just trying to predict the 10% that may not do so well. And therefore, we would argue that in that, those scenarios, a, a, an LET should be added. An LET may still provide a benefit when added to a patella tendon or a quadricep tendon. Ultimately, you've got to ask yourself, what would your patient want? And this is a study where we asked our patients what their goals were. We asked a group of surgeons as well what their goals were. And ultimately, when you look at it, it's risk of re-injury. They don't want another injury of either their ipsilateral or their contralateral knee. This is a big event for them. So what is the final word with this young girl? Well, for now, add an LET. Your patients will thank you and also wait for the results of stability too, because I'm pretty sure it's gonna highlight some interesting thoughts in terms of graft choice in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors and colleagues throughout the stability group. Thank you.